Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our pro series about dual credit in Kentucky. My name is Robin Bear, and I'll be the host and moderator for today's session, which really gets to the heart of why all of us are here. It's all about the students. Today's session zooms in on advising and supporting our students. And, um, oh, let's see here. We got the wrong slide there showing. Um, and we are joined by some really special guests today. Um, first of all, we have Kristen Hornsby from NKU and Kristen specializes in uh, pathway majors and making sure that students are on track to get to the career or post-secondary goal that they have. And we also have her amazing partner from Highlands High School, Ms. Elise Carter, who teaches business courses, and she also collaborates with Kristen and other institutions of higher education. Her goal is that her students will have these wonderfully aligned experiences that really get them on track for their career and post-secondary goals. And last, but certainly not least, we're gonna connect with David Beach, and David coordinates disability services for students at the University of Kentucky, including students who are enrolled in dual credit. At the end of the session, Trinity Walsh will be back for our dual credit data moment and today's challenge. As always, we have the Q&A box open today, so please feel free to drop your questions there and we'll follow up with you or we'll post a Q&A document along with the recording of today's webinar and all the resources on CPE's website. So let's dive into supporting and advising students in dual credit coursework as we welcome Kristen and Elise and David into the room. Good morning, friends. I'd like to start our conversation today with a few questions for Elise. Now, remember, Elise is the business uh, teacher at Highlands High School up in Northern Kentucky. So Ms. Carter, um, would you please tell us just a little bit about yourself and your role there at Highlands? Hi, I'm Elise Carter. Um, I am the business teacher here at Highlands High School. Um, my role basically is post-secondary readiness. Um, I work with Northern Kentucky University, Kristen, um, Western Kentucky University, and the University of Cincinnati um, for kids who are interested in business and their post-secondary readiness as far as majors are going right into the career field. Oh, wonderful. So um, Elise, could you tell a little bit about how uh, your students are effectively advised about dual credit and how all that fits into their college and career goals there at Highlands. So our counselors have done a really great job in the past of uh, meeting with students 101, um, starting their freshman year and trying to figure out where they want to be by their senior year and having them really start to focus and think about their post-secondary goals. Um, and so kids who have um, spoke interest of business or entrepreneurship, um, we really put them on a track of getting them in what we call our Fort Thomas launch program. Um, there's different areas, but mine particularly with business. Um, and so kids uh, take three years where they will receive up to eight college credits, uh, many for free with the Work Ready Scholarship. Um, to And I teach those courses, so I am um, an SBS teacher at all those uh, universities. Um, and we look at and hone in into opportunities uh, that are general educations for any business major. And then um, by their third year with me, we're really focusing on what they want to be. So um, if you're interested in accounting, uh, if you're interested in marketing, if you're interested in entrepreneurship, we're having you um, dive a little deeper into um, upper level courses now that you've taken those basics to see if that's really what you want to pursue. The secondary, while it's either free or very inexpensive, then waiting till you know your junior or senior year at the college level and realizing you're too far in to potentially make that change. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Lisa. I love how you're thinking about business as a big category and then helping students zoom in on specific areas that they find interesting or that they have passion about. Um, I know that your coursework, you've um, you've shared before that your coursework is rigorous and sometimes goes beyond 
beyond even what the expectations are. And so I know that your students are getting a lot of content, but I also know that you have a big for the other benefits that being involved in dual credit can have for students. So can you talk a little bit about what are some of those other things, those other benefits that you see for students who are enrolled in dual credit? Yeah, so you mentioned like the rigor. Um, I think business sometimes has that um, reputation of being easy. Um, and so I really have worked hard the 11 years I've been in this district to um, kind of change that uh, narrative um, in that we can bring rigor. Um, I offer, uh, like I said, up to eight courses um, with dual credit between those three universities. And then I teach two AP courses. So students are, you know, actually taking courses that mean something and understanding post-secondary what that looks like. So a lot of my um, requirements for the course as far as assignments and turning in, or um, I'm, my kids know I'm a quality versus quantity um, when they start asking me questions like how many slides right now, um, Trinity and I are um, actually reviewing uh, presentations from their internships, which is something that's added. Um, and when they ask questions, I am quality over um, quantity. Um, I expect rigor. I expect um, I have a high expectations that any other AP or dual course has. Um, with the launch program, we do two particular projects, which is social leadership, where they actually have to go out with nonprofits um, and actually find something they need. And then um, it could be as easy as I have to clean out uh, senior citizens yards, maybe the leaves, because um, it's in that fall. Or it could be uh, we had a, a, a group who wanted to help teachers. And so they worked with crayons to computers um, and they raised um, $1,500 worth of supplies um, that they donated to crayons com to computers. So getting them out in the community and finding what the needs are and act actually being active um, in uh, uh, doing uh, great things. Um, and then right now they're working um, on their entrepreneurial mindset course where they actually had the whole semester find an entrepreneur go out. So it's great that I'm teaching them those things, but to actually go in and see um, what the day-to-day -day responsibilities of an entrepreneur is, um, they go three times a week, um, three hours, um, and uh, see what the businesses are, work with the business, create a project. Uh, a lot of the entrepreneurs are having them kind of do the stuff they don't have time for, but that's business. Um, and then um, at the end, which is right now, the end of the semester, they report back um, to myself and whoever I have to come in and judge. And then we have the superintendents come in, uh, their administrators, their counselors to see their experiences um, and how relevant they were um, to understanding if they want to pursue that post-secondary or not. Wow. Elise, it sounds like that your um, your students are just getting this great opportunity to connect with business um, and industry where they might potentially work someday. And so to yep. build, start building that, that professional network and, and getting real life experience um, out in the world. I know coming off the heels of COVID, so many teachers talked about how students didn't have opportunities, you know, to really um, interact with each other and with their community. So that is an awesome story about how they're able to get out and work with nonprofits and other business and industry. Yeah. I wanted to, um, to ask about, and that is, I've heard you kind of talk about this a little bit, but um, I want to I wanna just zoom in on it real specifically, is how do you feel like participation in the business pathways that you have really helps the students to, um, to build high expectations for post-secondary education, like what they will do and how they'll perform and, and just that college going culture, you know, among your, among your students. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So I think um, them being in this pathway, the idea is that, you know, there are at times a lot of work which is, you know, college, there's sometimes where you're, you know, honed in, especially after you maybe midterm or in a semester. Um, but there's also that freedom of, of um, I can do this either Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, or Tuesday and Thursday. Um, and so it's that time management that our kids don't always have a good grasp of, of, you know, looking at their week and, oh, I have a soccer game or I have a cheerleading competition. Oh, and then I have this project. And so really working to time manage and understanding the use of not only their classroom time, but their outside time effectively, um, because deadlines are deadlines and you're eventually your employer could care less that, you know, potentially you were up all night. You should have, you know, worked 
backwards in the sense of making sure you, you met that deadline uh, or there's potential consequences. Using your resources, we have people come in and work with them on creating their presentations and walking through their pres uh, walking through their presentation. Um, and some kids use that resource and others it, and then it's starting to show in their presentations who did the haves and the have nots. Um, and I think first semester versus second semester, first semester, the kids who didn't realize they should have. And so now they're taking advantage of that second semester. And so I hope that then transfers um, post-secondary when your teacher is telling you, your, your um, professor is telling you to use your resources, that you're actually going to use those resources. They're not just saying it because they have nothing better else to do with their time. Um, <laughs> there's a yeah. reason for it. Um, and so uh, I think that's the benefit of understanding, you know, what their life is going to look like and, and taking advantage of those opportunities. Yeah, thanks. You know, that's a great transition to the conversation um, with Kristen about uh, her uh, work with students at NKU. I know that so many of the uh, colleagues of ours talk about that first year experience and getting students ready for that first year, especially a lot of those soft skills that Elise talked about. So Kristen, would you um, just introduce yourself to us? Tell us a little about your role there at NKU. Of course. Thanks, Robin. My name is Kristen Hornsby. I am the Associate Director for School-Based Scholars, which is our dual credit program, uh, as well as uh, articulation agreements. So I really specialize in those sort of onboarding type programs, whether it's from the school or from the community colleges. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to, to be here with you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. We're so glad that you're here. And especially we love hearing about partnerships. And so I'm I'm glad that the you're you're tag teaming with Elise today. So um, you know, we sometimes hear about students, they they tell us stories about having dual credit sort of done to them in schools. And you know, we actually even hear stories that students are enrolled in dual credit and they don't even realize they're enrolled in a dual credit course. And so I wanted to hear a little bit about how you work to inform and involve students in that decision-making process, make sure that um, what they're doing in high school um, in their dual credit work is actually aligned and that they really understand how it, how it connects to their career or post-secondary pathway. Well, first, I think it's important that students understand that college is different from high school, even if the dual credit course that they're taking uh, is located on their high school campus. So communication and self-advocacy by the student are really of the utmost importance, not just to success, but to making the most of their dual credit experience. Um, so we try to plant that seed from the very start at our information sessions, and then again in the admission letter, and again in the student orientation. Um, and so course selection is one of the areas in which students can really get involved in that decision-making process. Um, as students are earning increasingly more dual credit hours, it's becoming more important that they really think about the courses that they're going to take and how those courses apply to the hours that are needed for the degree so that they can make those meaningful choices. So we have a number of resources and tools in place to help students make informed decisions. Um, one of these is our career exploration track. So we have over 20 of these tracks and they serve as advising tools for students who are interested in exploring a particular uh, area of study, a major, a minor. Each track outlines four courses that the students can take uh, to earn up to a semester's worth of credit in that chosen area of study. Um, these include both general education and inter-level coursework in that area. Uh, and many of these courses align with the CTE pathways at the high schools. Um, and the majority of them are covered by those KIA dual credit or uh, KIA work ready dual credit scholarships. Extra benefit, if they decide that it's something that they don't want to major in, they've learned that lesson early and in a uh, cost-saving environment, so. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. I, I heard Elise loud and clear say, you know, this is kind of a, a time for students to experiment and see what they really are passionate about or what they really enjoy, and then have this opportunity, just this little window, trial and error to say, you know, where, where do I, where do I really um, belong? So I know that your, your role there is really related to these pathways and um, that you, that you've already mentioned. So are, are there other advising and student supports that, that you provide there? 
Absolutely. So we have 1,800 students annually, and there are only two of us in the school-based scholars office. So we've had to be inventive in how we get the students the advising that they need. Um, so in addition to those exploration tracks, we have other tools like a general education checklist um, and a list of course recommendations by major. Um, so not only do the students have access to these tools, but our counselors and our high school partners have access to these tools too, uh, because they know the students better than we do. Uh, our counselors and, and high school contacts are, are a huge resource in helping us make sure the students are getting the courses that they want and need. Um, particularly if the students are taking only one or two courses. But we do have a special populations advisor on our campus. Um, so if students are taking multiple courses or if they're coming to our campus or just have a lot of questions about the college experience, we try to connect them with that advisor who can then help them select the courses that fit their needs and their goals. Um, and then of course, once the students are enrolled, our students in our program can utilize all of our campus resources to help support their success. So things like free tutoring, the writing center, the office of accessibility and, and others. Um, we also have workshops and resources for our high school partners and for our faculty, uh, just so that they can be prepared and uh, best help us support the students because as we all know, it takes a village. <laughs> that is so true. I, I wish we had, you know, like, to talk about this. I'm sure that everybody on the call today would love to hear more and more and more about all of these different supports and resources. But I want to loop back to one thing you said, and then I'm going to, I'm going to shift gears and we're going to talk to David for a few minutes. But one last question for you and for Elise. You mentioned that your partnership with teachers and counselors at the high schools that you um, that you have these agreements with. I wonder if you all could at least you can you can chime in here too. If you all could talk a little bit about the secret sauce that makes partnership between NKU and Highland so effective that and you know that really is the best benefit for students. Kindness. <laughs> uh, Kristen probably sick of me at this point. And, you know, I love WKE you Lee. right now as well. Um, it's for me. It's just you know professional relationships and and owning your mistakes and asking for forgiveness. And I think if you if you kind of lead with that, um, Kristen tends to be a lot nicer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it's just important that everybody's on the same path. So from the counselors to the teachers to the um, individuals you're working with at the university level, so whether it's Kristen or someone at UK or WKU or Eastern, um, it's understanding what everyone's um, um, intentions are. Like ours, uh, Kristen mentioned that, you know, uh, the pathways, the KDE pathways. And so the courses that I choose to teach or I'm elected to teach at, from the university standpoint allows me to then fulfill requirements so that our kids are still transitioners or completers. I don't know what the correct words because I feel like that changes every other day. Um, but whatever that meaningful thing is for KDE for our school's report card, um, we're meeting it because we're we're making sure we're not only aligned at KDE, but at the university and finding those courses that match that kids can explore um, post-secondary, uh, whether they're going into the workforce or they are going to pursue um, either a business major or something to that nature. Yeah, thanks, Elise. Yeah, I agree with everything Elise was just saying. Um, you know, I think at the heart of the partnership is a common goal of just creating opportunity for the students and wanting to see them successful as they work toward their goals. Um, and truly everyone at Highland, from the counselors and the teachers to the administrators at the, the school and district level, um, are all so supportive of the students and of the partnership. Um, and I think there is a level of open communication and respect that allows us to so efficiently work together to continually develop our offerings and resources um, and create new opportunities for the students like the new leadership courses that Elise will be you're heading in the fall. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think we need t-shirts that say kindness on them, Elise. Thank you for bringing that up. I love the personal connection that the two of you clearly uh, clearly have and that it's working so well for, for the student outcome. So thank you all so much. Uh, David, I'm going to uh, I'm going to turn some questions toward uh, your direction now. So welcome to the conversation. Um, would you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your role there at the University of Kentucky? Yeah, thanks, Robin. Um, so our role at the Disability Resource Center at the University of Kentucky 
is to ensure that students that are otherwise qualified for, uh, you know, to, to participate in post-secondary education opportunities have an equal opportunity to participate in those types of activities. And it's you know, we do that through ensuring academic accommodations. Sometimes it may be housing, it could be dining. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's you know, if, if a student is having that, you know, is trying to have that experience at the university, we, we intercede, be it physical accessibility or, or other accommodations to ensure that they have, you know, some kind of pathway uh, to, to uh, you know, complete their studies. Okay, well, thanks for the introduction. And um, I want to dive into kind of how your role relates to dual credit. We know from our state's data that too, too few of our students with disabilities are taking advantage of dual credit. So um, many times it's related to lack of oper lack of communication. That's what we hear from the field is that it's uh, sometimes lack of communication with families or lack of support for students. So I'm just curious how you and the University of Kentucky have worked to make dual credit more accessible and supportive for exceptional students. So, you know, the first thing that we did is identified who was working on the, the dual credit, you know, kind of process and, and policies. Um, because we, we were starting to hear rumblings, not rumblings, but, you know, uh, information from our partners at different universities about dual credit. And we wanted to make sure we were prepared for this. So we, we were able to finally connect and then have the conversation uh, from the explanation of how's this policy working um, in terms of dual credit students coming to the university, how are we going to identify students with disabilities and make sure that those are uh, referred to us so that we can make sure that, um, you know, this, this will meet their accommodations need in terms of, of the university setting. Yeah. So, yeah. so what we do is, you know, every, every semester, uh, we set up a point person that at each school that communicates with with our point person here who passes that along to us and, and then we work with the students and families to make sure that that uh, the, the accommodations the appropriate accommodations are provided yeah i i love how you mentioned that um, intentional communication because that's what we hear is like it's almost like who's on first whose responsibility is it to do this or whose responsibility is it to do that and so that intentionality about making sure students needs are, are met really appreciate that you know um, I understand that um, when a student transitions to college whether it's through dual credit or you know their first year that many services are still available to them but uh, for the student it's a big shift because now the responsibility for requesting those services is more on them where whereas when they're in the k-12 system it's a it's kind of a different you know it's kind of a different process so can you tell us a little bit more about the services that are available to students students and how they can make sure that they have access to them, um, you know, at their earliest uh, moments in, in their post-secondary experience. Sure. So let me, let me kind of address the dual, uh, dual credit opportunities first in terms of accommodations, because they can be, they can be somewhat difficult because what happens is we're straddling two laws. We're straddling IDEA uh, Individuals with Disabilities for Education Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act. So we're kind of doing both and it looks a little different at the high school level in terms of, com of accommodations as it does at college. However, the, even though the accommodations may be a little bit different, we, you know, we still provide them and many, uh, many accommodations that, that they do receive are going to be available you are correct in, in the communication is a little bit different, different when someone is seeking to enter a university. Yes, they do have to uh, register for services. They have to provide documentation. Um, but, you know, we, we are we are structured in such a way that we, you know, we try to, you know, you know, help the students access us. Um, and, you know, but I do want to say one of the things that we struggle with, even as a profession, is making that connection uh, for the uh, for the schools out there, especially dual credit, because, um, 
what we find unfortunately is there wasn't a lot of thinking through about accommodations until it's you know until we're in the semester and somebody will say well they had a 504 plan you know testing's coming up what do we do so you know of course we, we don't care to jump in there and help and of course it's going to be individualized based on the setting or the student or their needs or whatever uh, but it, it's important to have that conversation as early as possible between the school and the you know whoever you're working with even if you have to go to the, the disability office um, but that's an important piece to to um, to do early in the process if you're in the in the process of choosing a school I would recommend you know make sure you go on a tour and um, and schedule time talk with the disability office um, you know talk about the process uh, talk about the documentation that's going to be needed about how many you know how many folks the uh, or students the uh, university serves with disabilities how many staff they have de dedicated you know, any specialized services they had the processes by which they uh, communicate with faculty about a students with disabilities. Um, yeah, I would definitely encourage, you know, taking a visit, spending, you know, investing, you know, probably 30, 45 minutes um, and understanding how uh, uh, that university you know, provides these services so that you're, 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 you're well informed. I mean, it doesn't seem like, you know, we don't, it, often don't think of you know the drc as being something that's as important as you know the recreation areas or the classrooms or things like that but um you know we have to you know we, we have 3700 students so you know we have to make you know, we, we take it very serious making sure those students have accommodations and you know i would you know, recommend for students that need accommodations to to be sure to make that part of their selection process. Oh, that's great advice, David. I was gonna ask you what advice would you give students and you've really summarized that well. So before they decide which um, college or university to attend, check out the disability uh, resources uh, office and um, just find out a little bit of information so that you know if it's gonna be uh, a good fit for you. All right, well, thank you all so much for the conversation today. Time flies, it always does during these, during these webinars. I'm sure that people will have some follow-up questions. We hope that you'll drop those into the Q&A box um, if you have questions for David or Elise or uh, Kristen. And at this time, I'm gonna turn the conversation over for our data moment and our dual credit challenge with Trinity Walsh. Hello and welcome to the dual credit challenge for today. As always, we've heard some amazing ideas on how to help our students with their dual credit programming and to make it more relevant to their futures, but ideas on how post-secondary and secondary folks can implement these practices and do it collaboratively. Um, so I'm gonna highlight some resources today that are going to help you to um, dig into the data. Now, a lot of these resources I might have talked about before in the past, um, but this should help you to connect some of the dots, not only on your student populations, but this time thinking about specific students. Um, there's four reports in KY Stats that have some of the most robust information in the state when it comes to looking at students and their futures. So after this webinar on our um, CPE page, we will have links to these four reports that I think are going to be very, very helpful for you in understanding what your students look like and what kind of pathways they have. You'll be able to see what the workforce outlook, outlook is for your community, where your students are interested in, and where these two pieces of information intersect. And so I'm going to be honest, to do this with fidelity, it's going to take some time and a team approach. Um, and so it, your best bet might be to look at it from multiple perspectives. So that's why I've given you several different reports to use. Um, each of your students in grades six or 12 at the secondary level have an ILP, which should indicate some capacity for a future college or career plan. 
Um, I always told my students that, you know, their ILP um, outlook wasn't always set in stone, but it was a place to start for some real exploration. And that's one of the things that Kristen and Elise talked about is that, you know, understanding um, what they might like now and deciding that before they get into college and they've spent a lot of money. Um, so collecting this data is something to think about. So how are you collecting um, this data with your ILPs and what's it telling you? And are you offering the courses for students that align with your future aspirations? Um, these questions could be easily found. Some of them might be more of a challenge to you. And then the other question I would have for you is when you figure out what pathways or particular um, major areas that your students are looking for, are you offering the most rigorous courses available um, for your students um, so that you can make sure that they are getting ready for that post-secondary um, life after high school? Um, Northern Kentucky University has done an excellent job of providing resources in easy to follow way for secondary advisors and students. Additionally, um, I would also have to say Thomas Moore and Western Kentucky have similar pathway guidance as well. So we'll make sure that we share those links. Um, if a post-secondary institution doesn't have something laid out like this targeted to dual credit students, um, I would really encourage you to do so. And if not, as a high school person who is helping to guide these students, use um, those university major course plans. So I think University of Kentucky has some great um, course plan outline, things that are outlined when you look at uh, specific majors. So for example, if you have a student who might be interested in anthropology, you probably don't have that offered at your high school, um, but are there any courses in that major that a high school student could take on campus or online to get a better understanding of that major and just have those conversations with the dual credit partners um, that you're working with. And beyond taking courses and choosing a major, another um, component, um, you know, is dealing with that communication, um, especially with students with disabilities. So this might be hard to navigate sometimes, especially because it's different than the secondary education world. Um, and so, and just like David said, it's very tricky sometimes when there is still in high school. So my best piece of advice for you is to communicate and communicate often. School counselors and college and career coaches um, or dual credit coordinators, whoever's in charge of that programming at your school, I would encourage you to talk to your local institutions and their disability services. I would encourage all high schools to have some kind of dual credit family night, live or in person, and, you know, right around your scheduling time when students are making these choices. Um, and at this event, have someone from a local institution's disability services office there to help answer some of those questions. This may help alleviate a lot of confusion for not only the students and the families, but also for um, those who are in charge at the school of the, the dual credit programming. Post-secondary institutions, I would encourage you to partner with your high schools at these types of meetings, but if you cannot, maybe create some sort of informational flyer or link on your website that is informative and easy to navigate for dual credit students, their families, and for dual credit professionals, you know, maybe something as easy as a checklist so that they know what they need to be doing so that they're prepared for their students. Bottom line, and we've heard it multiple times today, in order to make a dual credit program more accessible and relevant, we have to ensure that we're advising our students appropriately. And that can come up from a variety of advisors. So school counselors, dual credit coordinators, college and career counselors, those are the ones that are usually the people that we automatically think of, the college personnel. But also think about, you know, a lot of schools have um, advising programs with the teachers. So how do we get those teachers involved and understand what's happening as well? So so communication is key. Collaboration is what we need. So dual credit advising, definitely, it takes some teamwork to do that. So keep working together. And I think we'll all be making good um, opportunities for our students. Thank you so much, Trinity, for the data moment and the challenge. Before we go today, I have just a quick couple of reminders. First of all, if you haven't signed up for our dual credit community of practice, please use the QR code on the screen to do so now. 
Uh, we've met a couple of times informally, but we do plan to fully launch the com uh, communities by summer, so you don't want to miss out. If you're interested, go ahead and fill in the information and we'll, um, we'll communicate with you about where we are in the process. Also, our final dual credit webinar in this series is coming up on May 4th. I can't believe we're coming into the, to the end of this series. This last session will focus on financial support that is available for dual credit coursework. We will hear from Becky Gilpatrick, who is the state expert on all things uh, dual credit scholarship and work ready scholarships, and she is the director of student aid services at KIA. Um, and so she'll be talking about everything that's available to students and how to effectively navigate these systems so that you can make sure the process is smooth and efficient uh, and that students get the maximum benefit. Uh, I also want to remind you all about the new uh, CPE toolkits that are available and the resources for advising and all things early post-secondary opportunity. You can access these uh, toolkits. I'll drop the um, I'll drop the, uh, let me see here. I'll drop the links into the, um, it, let me see here if I can do that. Well, no, I'm, I'll show the links in a minute. Um, I'll make sure that you have those uh, at the end of the, uh, at the end of the session, but we do have the EPSO toolkit that has, uh, we introduced last week. It has all kinds of information about early post-secondary opportunities and especially dual credit. We also have the Kentucky Advising Toolkit that has just been launched um, that is coming from the Kentucky Advising Academy. So all kinds of resources for, um, for you to access in advising and supporting students. Before we leave today, please drop any final questions that you have for us into the question and answer box before you go. And we wanna just say thanks again uh, for joining us. Happy Thursday, and we'll see you next week for the very last in our series of dual credit webinars.